Jesus Fasalo is a Spanish architect based in Houston and Madrid, working on different kinds of projects ranging from buildings to urban design with consistent emphasis on construction and design excellence. On top of the architectural practice, he is also a professor at Rice University with areas of focus, including low carbon construction technology, affordable housing, and public interest design. So today we'll be chatting with Jesus in regards to those topics and really looking forward to hearing it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Karina. It's my pleasure. The pleasure is ours. So will you first tell us about your background and about the studio? Sure. So I am originally from Madrid, Spain. Um, studied here in the Polytechnic School in Madrid at San, and then did some work, did a master's degree at uh, Harvard in the U.S., and then came back and worked for six, seven years plus, um, doing mostly cultural buildings, uh, you know, for, for, uh, for the government, uh, museums, libraries. I was working as part of a bigger firm called Nancy Antunion, who at the time were very relevant in, in, in the context of Spain. And then eventually I started teaching and getting more serious about writing as well and landed this teaching position at Rice University in Houston. So I've been there for 10 years now, I spent some years mostly writing, um, did a PhD, published a few books, etc. And then in 2019, I started my own office, Jesus Basalo. And so I am now in maybe the fourth year of basically the, the architectural production of my own, of my own firm. Mm. That's super cool. How would you describe your design approach? I think I'm especially curious about how has your extensive experiences in teaching and writing influenced your way of thinking in design and architecture? Sure. So I think in general, when people ask about the design approach or how I think about uh, the sort of uh, design process, I always say that I understand design as, as, as an, an effort to reconcile your own uh, private obsessions about architecture and design with the needs of society. That, that, that For me, that's the design process is you come to a problem with your own baggage and your own ideas about how architecture should be, et cetera, but then you're basically responding to, to a need and you're trying to respond to other people, to other people's uh, needs and the society at large as well. And so I think, I think you cannot do it, you cannot um, disappear yourself, right? Like you cannot pretend that you don't have, you know, your own your own agenda as a, as a designer. But what's interesting is trying to be, I think for me, the best outcome is when you're really transparent and get to a result where basically you're both, um, you're contributing to these goals that are more objective and that have to do with other people, but you're doing it with your own sensibility. Right? And, uh, and then I think that your question about the influence of teaching and writing is very good because in that sense, my career is a little bit different because usually people start practicing when they are out of school. They do a little bit here, a little bit there. And when they have three or four projects, they, they try to look at them no? and, and say what does, and they start writing to try to figure out what does that mean, right? At, at large, like how are they contributing, et cetera. In my case, it's different because I was working for other architects. And then I became a writer and, in, and, and a pretty well-known writer also. And so everybody knows who I am. Everybody knows what I think about stuff. I've written about a lot of important people and a lot of them. And so when I start my practice already, you know, in, in my 40s, everybody knows who I am. Everybody knows what I think about stuff. It puts a lot of pressure, right? Like how, how do you, um, it, can, it could be a little bit daunting initially. Um, but I have to say, I have, I have enjoyed the process uh, a lot. Uh, I think it's a really, it's a little bit uncommon, but it's, it's, it's nice to start your own firm once you're a little bit older, because you somehow have a better, you know yourself a little bit better, you know, and you're a little bit more mature as a designer. I'm, I would say in, in writing, uh, a, a lot of my effort has been to, to talk and try to figure out what, um, uh, an idea of realism could be for architecture today. I think uh, I, I think realism is a beautiful way to think about what architecture can contribute to the world today and the problems of the world today. And so after writing about that for quite a while uh, in the abstract, but also talking about other architects' work, and that has helped me then, basically when I go into a project, I have like a, like a, 
I think my 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 values are already there. No? Like I've already put them down on paper, and the ethics of the practice is already there implicitly, etc. So it has. It, I, think, I would say it has helped me, you know, uh, find a find a way into design. Yeah, better clarity. Mm -hmm. um, so how how do you approach construction in your projects? That's also a good question. I would say, I in in my case, in the case of our office, uh, construction is one of the generators of of design, right? So it, there's there's a more traditional way of, uh, or I would say, when I studied in the '90s, maybe, and the early 2000s, you would start with things like the site, the program, the shape of the building, and then eventually you would work towards the materials, right, and the structure. But it it, it that was the sequence. Right? And I and I always thought that was really strange uh, because all the buildings that I really, really liked, I liked because when you approach them and you saw how they were made, that was the fascinating part, right? And that's also like ancient architecture is like that too, right? Like old temples are like that too. And uh, vernacular architecture in the mountains where I'm here right now is like that too. It's like the, uh, it's very much about how it's put together and it's very much about the qualities of construction material. So, I try to put construction materials always at the center of the of the design process and at the beginning of the design process, right? So if if we're gonna make this house in wood, because that's what's available in this region, then what does that mean? Like how do you how do you take advantage of that um, to turn it into the what generates the project in a way, right? And I think materials are also construction materials are very important because it's what joins architecture with uh, uh, the, with industry, with production, right? With that part of society that is really, um, and we do have a lot of power as architects because we decide what the buildings are made of. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's really how we can contribute to sustainability, how we can contribute to fair trade and social justice is through being very mindful in how we work with construction materials. So I really try to pay a lot of attention to that. Yeah, yeah that's really nice. Um, in your experiences in, you know, exploring urban design, um, I'm also curious how might urbanism um, be shaped by acts of public interest design and if you can give um, some examples of it? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say urbanism is always about uh, public interest in a way, right? Because mm -hmm. that's, uh, it, it, it's mostly about what happens outside of the property lines, right? And, uh, and about the urbanization of the public realm. Um, and then when we talk about public interest, at least in the U.S., it's mostly it's mostly when architects try to make projects for people who otherwise would be disenfranchised, right? Like maybe there's a community, you know, that has a problem in their neighborhood, mm -hmm. but they don't have enough money and enough time to organize themselves and advocate. And so architects become a little bit... Uh, um, advocates in that way you know and uh and basically try to uh try to do those those works basically but then urbanism at large when it's done uh you know like at at the state level right or a government level it's always about public service anyway um i for instance in houston a lot of uh, the public interest uh, work that we do is about public realm Right, like there's a there's an empty space in a neighborhood. It could be used for the community, but it's not, you know, it's not properly equipped. It's not properly organized, and so we go out and try to find some people who would donate some money, and then we always work with nonprofit organizations, right? And they do that part. They go out, they talk to the neighbors, see what the neighbors want. They go out, they try to find donors who will donate money, and then we just donate our time to do the design. Imagine of a small plaza or a you know, a small civic center, or, you know, maybe there's some housing that has deteriorated and, you know, it would be better for the whole neighborhood if those housing blocks and the public spaces around them were in better shape than the neighborhood could use that space. And so we, um, I think that would be an example, at least in how we practice uh, public uh, interest design in Houston, which is through finding uh, small public spaces that are under designed or under uh, equipped to try to to get them to be a catalyst for the improvement of those communities but they're always a small interventions 
That's nice. So um, maybe going back to uh, the before questions about construction techniques, um, will you share with us about uh, your mass timber pavilion project? Yes, of course. So that's a good example, I think, of what I meant by putting the material at the center of the project and having the construction material be what generates the ideas for the project. This is a, a, a design that we started in the classroom with my students at Rice University. Mm -hmm. um, we had won a, a grant from the uh, Forest Service, from the American uh, Agriculture Department, and um, to use uh, CLT, counter laminated uh, timber. And so we started in the in the classrooms in analyzing the material itself. Right? It, I don't know if you're familiar, but it, it's usually it's these large panels of wood that are laminated in alternating directions, and they're roughly you know, 10 feet wide by 40 feet long, more or less, right? Um, depends on the factory, but that's how they're made, right? These big blank panels, no? And they are also, they always say it works similar to concrete structurally, but in reality, when you look at it, it's different in a number of ways. It's lighter. Uh, it doesn't really work uh, two ways, the way that concrete can be a two-way structural system. It's a, like a one, and a one and a half way system in a way because it has a strong direction, it has a weak direction. The way that you can support it is also different, right? Like it has some limitations. And so just really looking at the, at the raw material, the limits, but also the possibilities, like what can it do better than other materials? Which in this case, I think, is the fact that it can behave like uh, like many many uh, architectural elements because of these sort of one and a half way property, right? The fact that it can be used as a floor, as a roof, as a pillar, as a capital. It can be as as, as beams, even you know. If, so, and that and we thought that this was very beautiful. That there was this blank material that is very homogeneous you know and, and also very perfect because it's made in a factory and uh, and that it can perform as all of these essential elements of architecture and so that that was the idea for the pavilion which has these sort of eight columns and then capitals that shift 90 degrees they are all rotated in a slightly random fashion and then the and then the roof is just made of the of the whole panels right like the of the and so it's almost like a, it's a very didactic design in the sense that when you see it, you immediately understand what the pieces are, how they're put together. You know, it's a little bit like a piece of furniture that is displaying, you know, its own its own making or the logic of its own making. And um, yeah, and, and I think that's a good example of how we try to basically work with construction materials as something that can generate the ideas for a project. Yeah, and I think we... The, the, the project also has this sort of indeterminacy to it in a way, the which also has to do with how it works structurally, right? Everything has a slight angle, yeah. and that and that instead of being in a in a straight grid, but that actually that actually helps with it somehow uh, the building braces itself. It doesn't need extra bracing or, and and it also talks about how the pavilion is in a natural area and the purpose of the pavilion is a nature observation uh, uh, deck. And so, and so it's also like this, it's a little bit like a house of cards where every panel is slightly rotated. And so when you're inside, it frames different moments of this natural reserve and people go there, st stay inside in the silence and just watch the birds, listen to the nature, etc. So it's also this, the homogeneity of the material helps to the, because it then becomes a, this, this building that is a slightly different from different uh, perspectives, whatever you look at it. Uh, it's always a slightly looks a slightly different and frames nature in a slightly different way. Mm, looks so beautiful. <laughs> so, lastly, in your opinion, what are the greatest challenges in future ar architecture, and how do you overcome them as an architect and change maker? So, I would say, the, um, I mean, our architecture is full of challenges. I say it's a profession of challenges. Uh, one thing I think about a lot uh, lately is the problems of cost, like how expensive it is to to build things, which means also that it limits a lot who can get things built, right? Like that. Okay. Um, and I think the construction industry for a very long time hasn't changed and hasn't been disrupted. Um, 
And then whenever there's inflation, like we've had in the past few years, it is like, it's like, it's so vulnerable to these shocks, right? And it really affects, uh, it really affects uh, uh, the people and their capacity to build the things that they need to build, right? So I think the, the, for me, of course, the biggest challenge in reality is how do we build sustainably for, you know, we have a lot of many, many billions of people in the planet. This planet is the only one that we have. Construction is a huge part of, of the industries that pollute the environment and produce CO2. So just let, I want to be clear that that, that is, that is uh, always in my mind as the first thing, like how do we build buildings that through the course of their life are beneficial for the environment. But being that the primary concern, there's always something else in the back of my mind, which is, but it's so expensive, right? Like, and, 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 and I find with every client and every project I find what we want to build is always too expensive, right? To for 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 the resources that we have. So I don't know. That's maybe a, a more difficult question. But how how could we maybe lower our expectations about you know what needs to be built, or how do we figure out ways to build, you know, with less? Yeah, and like you said, uh, architects have so much power in deciding what to build with and what to build, right? So. I think choosing right and choosing responsibly is key to making a better future. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you so much for sharing today. Um, we learned a lot and love learning about your um, approach to design and uh, looking forward to seeing more of your works. Thank you, Karina. I appreciate it.